This week we have been studying the meaning of words. We have studied how we can describe meaning through features or through prototypes that exemplify what the meaning should be. But there are a few words whose meaning is a little bit more complicated. They only have meaning when you use them in context, such as the words this and that, that don't really mean anything until you put them inside of a conversation. We're going to call these words deictics. So there's several types of deictics, and again, they only mean something once they are inside of a conversation and the context. For example, pronouns like I or you. The word you only has meaning when we know in the conversation who you are. There's um, adverbs, for example, space adverbs, uh, adverbs that refer to things like here, there, that only have a meaning once we know what here and there are. There's um, adverbs for time, like now, later, yesterday, tomorrow, that sort of come with half a meaning. They come with a meaning relative to whoever is talking, but they only get their full meaning once you know where you're standing so that you can know what yesterday is or what now is. There's also words that are demonstratives, such as this or that. You can only know what this is by knowing the context of the person, knowing what's near them, and knowing what specific object they're referring to. There's a subgroup of deictics called anaphoras. Anaphoras are a kind of deictic, like a pronoun, for, for which there is an explicit antecedent somewhere in the preceding discourse. For example, in the sentence, Sam really likes pizza, so she ordered a double cheese one. She is bringing it now. The words she clearly mean Sam in this sentence. And so we know that she refers to the same object as Sam because we know to look for the meaning of the pronoun somewhere in the preceding sentence. The ones uh, that match Sam have the subindex I in the sentence and are in red. There is a second anaphora in the sentence, which uh, is the one for pizza. She really likes pizza, so she ordered a double cheese one. She's bringing it now. So there's pronouns like one and it that are co-referencing the word pizza in the preceding discourse. So words like she and it are anaphoras because somewhere before we got a clue as to what she and it actually are. Anaphoras occur in every language. We have them in Spanish as well. This is the exact same sentence. A Sam le gusta mucho la pizza, así que ella ordenó una con doble queso. Ya la trae. There's something interesting going on here. Take a look at the red ones, the one for the ones for Sam. Sam starts here, and then we have the pronoun ella, which means she. But then if we had to use the pronoun again, in Spanish, we use zero. We use nothing. In English, you would just keep repeating the pronoun she, 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 she for every subsequent anaphora referring to Samantha. In Spanish, you have more than one option. You can use the pronoun she, but if you, we've mentioned her so much that we already know that we're talking about Sam, you can just use a zero pronoun. And this is the same zero that we saw in the syntax week when we called it little pro. So there are zero anaphoras in many languages. Japanese has them as well, as well as pronouns. So we have deictics, uh, which are any kind of word that gets its meaning from context. We have anaphoras, which are meanings that have a, an explicit referent in their preceding discourse, uh, Sam, she. We also have demonstratives, which are words that help us find something in physical space or in psychological space and time. For example, the words this and that in English and their um, plural equivalents, these and those, help us locate something, first of all, in physical space. If we say this, this phone, it means that it's close to the person who's speaking. If we say that phone, 
it means that it's probably closer to you. If we say something like that phone over there, it's probably not close to either of us. So these help us locate um, objects relative to the, the speaker or the hearer. Notice that it also helps us locate things in time. For example, um, this class that I had in the afternoon, which is something that is located near me temporally, or that class I had when I was in high school. That would be something further away. You can have um, more classes of demonstratives. For example, Spanish distinguishes between esto, eso, and aquello. Eso is used for things closer to the speaker. Eso is used for things close to the hearer or far away from the speaker. And aquello is used for things that are far away from both the speaker and the hearer. That might be in some third point of space and time. Aquella montaña, that mountain that neither of us is in contact with at the moment. There are more ways that you can divide the space and time around you. Bribri has a particularly interesting and complex demonstrative system. In Bribri, we have eight words for this and that, and they're split like this. First, by whether something is by whether something is below your field of view, at the same level as your field of view, or above your field of view. We have a further subdivision of, of whether something is visible and nearby, near the speaker or visible and far away from the speaker. So for example, du dieu, this bird, is this bird, but we imply that the bird is down there and down, bare, down there close to me, like this bird over here. If we say du ai, it will, mean, it will be this bird above me, but still nearby, like this bird over here. If we say du ai, it's that bird over there, that bird in the same uh, level of perspective as I am, but far away from me. There's a couple of demonstratives for things that are not visible, but I can hear. So, dunye is that bird I, that you can't see, but you can hear that it's somewhere over there. And we have e, which is for something that's remote in time and space. So it's used in, in storytelling, for example, in a story about a bird that happened a long time ago, they would tell you, du e, that bird from a long time ago. So as you can see, languages can split the space around you in many different ways. It can, it can be a very basic subdivision, uh, subdivision like English, where you have near and far, or it can be more divisions, like in Bribri. In summary, there are words that only have meaning in context. We call them dictics. There are, uh, these include pronouns, demonstrative pronouns like this and that, and some adverbs for space and time like here and there. There's, there are dictics that refer to elements that have been mentioned explicitly before, and we call these anaphoras. And these are usually pronouns like she or it in the example that we had.